All right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think maybe. Perfect. Hi. Welcome back. Happy New Year, everyone. It is, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first colloquium of the semester. Um, we have Dr. Sarah Rugheimer with us here today. Uh, so Sarah grew up in Montana, so we're welcoming her back to the, to the Mountain West um, uh, for a little visit. Um, uh, Sarah earned an under, undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Calgary. Um, she then got her PhD in astrophysics from Harvard University. This is where the two of, two of us met. We've spent some time together over the years. Um, uh, she then went on to be a Simons Research Fellow at St. Andrews University, a Gladstone Research Fellow at Oxford University, and she is now an Associate Professor at York University and the Alan Carswell Chair for Public Understanding of Astronomy for all of Canada, as I understand. <laughs> Um, uh, so she's won numerous awards over her career, including she was a Harvard Horizons Scholar. She was um, won the Caroline Herschel Prize for astronomy for um, junior women in the UK, um, the Barry Jones and Rosalind Franklin Prizes for outreach in astrobiology. Um, she was a 2020 TED Fellow. Um, there is a talk online that you can go watch. 1.7 million views. It's not. It's like it's pretty good talk about astrobiology. Um, <laughs> Uh, it went, I, I gather that was a, a rough year to be a TED Fellow. Uh, it was a super rough year. Yeah, 2020. <laughs> um, uh, importantly, um, throughout my career, Sarah has also been one of my kind of go-to sources for um, like mental health in academia and how do we get through this complicated thing that we're doing. And a lot of her advice um, is distilled into um, a now slightly archival um, a podcast um, called Self Care with Doctors Sarah. Um, uh, so with Sarah Ballard, um, the two of them had the, a lot of these really great conversations, inviting guests in to talk about um, sort of what what it's like to be an academic. Um, and these were a great resource for me, getting through kind of my first few years as a professor here. So so thank you for those, Sarah. Um, uh, and Sarah is also um, a, a mountain climber. Um, she'll be going back this spring to climb Denali a second time. Um, and uh, so when I talk about uh, observing the atmospheres of exoplanets, I always like have this little story of you're watching sunset high up on a mountaintop in Earth's atmosphere and you're seeing the light filter through, through the atmosphere and over your shoulder and blah, 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 blah. But for me, it's always like, it's Sarah standing on top of that mountaintop um, is, is who I am imagining in that analogy. Um, so today we get to hear um, uh, her scientific story about um, uh, astrobiology. So take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Zach, for that uh, kind introduction. It's really great to be back at Boulder. Um, I really love Boulder and also love the mountains, as you've heard. But I'm most excited today to talk to you about my research, which is in biosignatures. So I'm really uh, interested in this question of how can we detect life on another planet. And so I'll be talking to you today about especially the UV radiation and how that influences habitability. And so, oh, my thing is not working again. I'm interested in this question. Are we alone in the universe? Can we find aliens before I die? That's why I'm a scientist, you know? And so I think often when I give public talks, especially the public thinks I'm talking about Pandora, you know, bioluminescent vegetation. We find planets and we know that they have continents and oceans. Uh, what theorists like myself claim we're gonna find is this lovely, easy to characterize spectra, no error bars whatsoever, um, clear signs of vegetation and carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen, ozone, and then, of course, uh, observational astronomers will humble us in that, of course, it's going to be a pale blue pixel. There's going to be maybe several models that we're going to need to try to figure out to break these degeneracies and error bars on our data, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard, and then even if we know it's in the atmosphere, trying to figure out what that means is going to be hard. So the way I like to think about this is there's two challenges that we have to overcome in the next few decades to detect life on an exoplanet. The first one is just this technological challenge. Can we uh, make that observation? Can we detect those molecules? And the second one is what does that mean? What is the interpretation of those signals? So, you know, the other thing I like to think about, there's a lot of planetary scientists here. You know, we know a lot about the solar system and uh, atmospheres in the solar system and everything else. And then what we can know about exoplanets is just this tiny little bit. You know, we maybe know a mass radius within 20%, maybe. 
you know, and we're trying to now uh, get the atmospheres. So um, I like thinking about exoplanets in the solar system context as well, because you know the solar system provides us like this great laboratory to do a lot of uh, the physical ground truthing that we need to know, and then exoplanets are going to be that statistical relevant sample size for us to figure out how do planets work in general in the universe. So when I think about the timeline of excitement, we've been finding planets, oh, it jumped forward, but we've been finding planets for a long time, as you all know, and now we're entering the James Webb Space Era, right? We're actually getting the observations of these atmospheres uh, with really lovely error bars, but it's primarily for, you know, giant planets, and we're finding things like water and carbon dioxide and all those good things. It'll be harder to do for small planets. We're trying to do that. Uh, the error bars are going to be harder. It's going to take more observations. We're, as you probably have been aware of, the Trappist planet observations, uh, trying to come out for that. So mostly James Webb is going to be doing Neptunes. It's going to be doing uh, many Neptunes, gas giants. It's, it's going to be hard to do those terrestrial planets. And so to do Earth-sized planets, it's maybe you know, a handful that we're going to be able to get with James Webb. And so what I really want, because I want to find signs of life before I die, that's like why I went into becoming an astronomer, and so I think we're going to need something else. We're going to need something like the Habitable Worlds Observatory, and uh, also possibly something like LIFE, this mission which I'll talk about today, uh, the large interferometer for exoplanets. And these are where I think we're really going to be able to get that signal. So LIFE has this long heritage. You might have heard about TPFI or Darwin, um, so this is kind of that heritage uh, being repurposed now into life, and we're hoping that we'll have a launch sometime in my career, um, and, we're on, and I'm on this team. So the idea behind life, who's heard of life? Has anyone heard of life? A few of you. I'm so excited to tell the rest of you about this mission, <laughs> and I hope you follow our progress. So uh, the main purpose of life is we want to try to find, uh, characterize in the thermal emission spectra for a statistically meaningful sample size of habitable rocky planets. Uh, so that's looking to uh, ideally uh, investigate at least 30, ideally 50 exoplanets that are habitable, classically habitable. And um, that will hopefully, even the null result will be interesting. I'm part of this team here. Uh, Sasha is our fearless leader. I lead up the project office with uh, Daniel Angerhausen. And uh, then you know, we have a science team, technology team, and, uh, and instrument science team trying to develop the technology to get this actually a reality in our careers. So um, the goal is to assess habitability and especially look for biosignatures and to study, of course, the diversity of terrestrial exoplanet atmospheres. It's uh, using a nulling interferometry uh, uh, system where we would have around uh, two meter, probably, it would be great if they could be bigger, uh, 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 four two meter size uh, telescopes that will then have a beam combiner and through nulling interferometry be able to see um, the photons in the IR from the planet itself. And so they're very uh, complementary to what uh, NASA's Habitable Worlds Observatory is. So we can look here in reflected light. Um, that's going to be the Habitable Worlds. And then life is going to be the mid-infrared. And there's just different molecules that absorb in these different uh, regions. As well, as you can look, you, UV, I love UV. We're going to get to that. And you want UV with the Habitable Worlds Observatory. But you also want the molecules that you're going to get in the infrared. So I find them to be very complementary missions. So here you can see uh, like the sort of features that you can detect with each of these. So this is Habitable Worlds. This is life here on the top. And you can see that um, you know, we're not going to be able to get oxygen. Oxygen is in the visible. We'll not be able to detect that feature. But we will be able to get ozone, which is the proxy for oxygen. Uh, and, and we will be able to get carbon dioxide and methane. Methane is incredibly hard to do with habitable worlds, even if they get into the near infrared. Um, and uh, so you can't really do CO2 and methane with habitable worlds. Also getting a surface temperature, which would be super useful for assessing habitability, much harder uh, to do. And, and life is, is able to do that. The other thing I like to point out is the field of astronomy thinks this is important. You know, so this is an interesting uh, poll where we have the 2015 poll, 2020 poll. Red represents a decrease, green represents an increase in uh, people thinking these fields are going to be important uh, in the 2030s. Um, so the search for life outside Earth, woo, look at that. 
look at that. Um, planet system formation and evolution, same thing, uh, a big increase. So um, I think there's a large community agreement that, that these questions are interesting and important. So going back to this, there's these two main challenges. The technological hurdle, that's what we've been really talking about. And we're starting to overcome that, right? We have space space, space space telescopes like James Webb right now, in the future Ariel, and then eventually life and habitable worlds. Um, and we also have the large ground-based observatories also coming online in this decade, which will be very exciting to do high-resolution spectroscopy with, like, say, METIS on ELT from the ground to get these uh, observations. And there's like a trade-off between this. So in space, you can have low resolution, but it's easier to get the abundances. Um, in space, it's a, you have high resolution, which it, you can get the presence of it, but much harder to tease out what the abundance of the molecule is. Um, and so this is coming, you know, we're, we're doing this. We have this first opportunity now with James Webb coming in uh, the data. We're trying to hone out those error bars and James Webb see if TRAPPIST has an atmosphere or not, like the TRAPPIST planets have an atmosphere. And we'll be uh, looking at more planets in this decade. But then what I'm most excited about is this 25-year horizon where we're going to go to the next generation of space telescopes and actually really be able to characterize terrestrial, rocky, Earth-like habitable planets. So I like looking at this uh, kind of a respective view of, of our own technological improvements over the ages. We have Pluto. This is like the image we roughly had of Pluto in, in 1930s. Uh, and then this was Hubble Space Telescope uh, with Pluto in 1994, and then after some improvements on Hubble. This is not a fair comparison, but like, look at what we got with New Horizons. I mean, snow-capped mountains, you know, climbing. We could go there, you know? Um, it's great. And, and so, so just like thinking about even the last 100 years is really incredible. Um, of course, then we're going to have the interpretation hurdles, though. And so I like this little analogy, uh, the Cydonia region on Mars. Have you guys seen this, this face on Mars? Yeah, right? Uh, when, with low resolution data, it's easy to fool ourselves, which I think is a, you know, a lesson that we can take from some of our own uh, recent astronomy detections, like with Oumuamua, for example. Low resolution data, easy to interpret what you want to see. Um, and when we get high resolution, higher resolution data, sometimes those features completely disappear. So um, I like that quote from Feynman, you know, that science is a uh, way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is you must not fool yourself, and we're the easiest person to fool. Like, I want to find life, right? So we have to be super skeptical um, of getting, uh, being skeptical of ourselves, you know, uh, when we make that detection. So this image is going to be difficult to interpret. Like I said, it's like this pale blue pixel, you know, and I would argue there's probably only one uh, type of detection that would be unambiguous, and that's this, you know, hello, we're here. Um, then we would know we found life. Um, everything else is going to be fairly statistical. And so that's uh, where I tend to focus my research is this interpretation hurdle. Like, how are we going to know what we're seeing? Where can we be fooled? And how are we going to get through that? So I tend to look at kind of the intersection of stars, planets, and microbes. And, and in particular, the UV plays a role into all of these. And so that's where um, I spend a lot of my uh, research focus. And then trying to think about, OK, so how are we going to look for life? So there's uh, two ways that you can think of searching for life. And we can talk about the pros and cons maybe in the question and answer. But uh, there's life as we know it, right? This is like looking for carbon-based biochemistry, things like oxygen, CO2, water, methane, all these gases trying to figure out both the climate, the habitability, as well as are there biosignatures that we would not expect in combination just through geology and physics alone. And then there's life as we don't know it. This is this all small molecule approach. Uh, you might have seen this paper by Sarah Seeger, uh, where we consider any possible molecule that could be a biosignature and see if we can detect that. Um, but you know, there's, there's like different pros and cons to these approaches. So looking for alternative uh, biosignatures, I think the major pro here is it's not Earth-centric. That's great. The cons is we have no idea if those biosignatures exist um, and what those biosignatures would be. Right? Uh, the other thing is we can't tell if there's life in our own backyard. You know, if there's life on Mars or Titan or Europa or Venus. You know, we have no idea. And we have lots of observations of those systems. Uh, so looking for alternative biochemistries is just hard. Um, so I do think this is where we should focus solar system exploration, like looking in our solar system to see if we can find alternative uh, biochemistries and then figure out 
what distinguishes that uh, environment that we could maybe see from light years away. Uh, but as an exoplanet system, it's, it's incredibly hard to, to think about that. Um, we could also look for unique biosignatures. These are gases that uh, life only produces. There's no known false positives, so that's the main pro there, is there's no false positives for them. Uh, the cons, though, is they're usually very rare. They're limited to an evolutionary quirk. Usually only a single microbial species produces that gas, so they're not produced in high quantities. Uh, so it makes the detection in the spectra exceedingly difficult. We don't even have the spectra for most of these molecules, so we wouldn't be able to find them in ex exoplanet if they exist. And of the 16,000 possible molecules uh, that life produces that we know on Earth, we only have spectra of any quality, even poor, just like knowing where, like what wavelength has the, the greatest features. We only have that for 0.04% of the molecules, so it's just very difficult to uh, then uh, detect those in exoplanets. It's impossible, in fact. Um, so then it's like kind of back to searching for Earth-like life right now. Um, and one thing that I would say that we should be optimistic about this approach is that water and CO2 are abundant in the universe. They're everywhere we look. You know, carbon is more abundant than silicon, forms more complex chemistry. Water is polar, has unusual properties, and uh, all of life on Earth uses water, and they're everywhere. You know, so uh, the pros there being we might understand what we see, which would be great. Uh, oxygenic photosynthesis, I get this question a lot, especially from astronomers, like why oxygen? Why do we care about oxygen? This is why. So oxygenic photosynthesis uses photons, CO2, and water. These are abundant. It, uh, and because they're so abundant, it became the most successful biomass building product on Earth. Uh, it took like a more complicated, uh, you know, evolutionary pathway to, to produce oxygenic photosynthesis. It's not the easiest metabolism. Uh, say methanogenesis is easier. But like once you have oxygenic photosynthesis going, it's using things that are really common in the planetary environment. Um, and then complex life, it gives your greatest redox energy potential to be able to do a lot more cool stuff like walk around and climb mountains, you know. Um, so so that's, that's why we keep coming back to oxygen. There's no shortage of places to look, 40 billion Earth-like planets in our own uh, Milky Way. Of course, there's cons, right? You know, all of these classic biosignatures have known false positives as single gases, known geological or photochemical false positives. So that means you're going to need multiple gas detection. It's more expensive. You know, we're looking at multiple uh, missions, perhaps, you know, if we want uh, HWO plus life. Um, and still, we could be fooled. You know, we can't visit the planet and see alien kangaroos jumping around, you know? They're just, it's always going to be at a distant light years away looking for these features in the atmosphere. Um, and these, these false positives are strongest for M dwarfs. The UV environment is vital, which uh, Boulder is an excellent uh, partner in this uh, work because they've done all this research. And so we really need to understand the star for understanding the planet. So when we think about like the physics that go into modeling exoplanet atmospheres, here's just like for Earth, you know, this global energy balance. You know, we have uh, incoming solar radiation. Some of it's reflected by clouds. Some of it's absorbed by the surface. Some of it's reflected by the surface. And then we have the re-radiation of that, its interaction with the atmosphere and outgoing long wave radiation. When we think about this, this is what makes the visible part of our spectrum. And this is what makes the infrared part of our spectrum. Uh, for when we're looking at an Earth-like analog. Um, when we look at Earth, here is the sun. Uh, this is the visible spectrum. You can see this is Earth spectrum. We have these two humps. This is the visible reflected light, and this is the thermal emission. And you can see that uh, we have this massive signal problem, right? 10 billion photons from uh, the star compared to the Earth and the visible for an Earth-Sun uh, analog, uh, whereas in the infrared, it's only a million. Um, and then you have features like ozone and methane, which are super great uh, in the infrared, whereas in optical, you do get oxygen, which is uh, great as well as water. So, um, so for modeling for this, it's just like kind of show you kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the background of, of some of the results you'll see. Um, when, we, when I talk about climate code, we assume like a fixed chemistry and then we can calculate the heating and, and water abundance in the atmosphere, so you get your temperature pressure profile from that. You can use a photochemical code which assumes a fixed temperature pressure and it calculates where are the photons getting to, what are the kinetic and photochemical reaction rates in each layer of the atmosphere. You can then iterate between those two and you get a stable atmosphere. Uh, in a forward model, understanding like all the physics that goes into that planetary atmosphere. 
You can then take that, um, those outputs, and put that into uh, line by line rate of transfer code and generate the spectra that you can then put into your favorite instrument simulator, Habitable World, Life, um, et cetera, to figure out how well we could detect those features. So what I'm really interested in and when I think about uh, atmospheres, it's like what wavelengths, what resolution, how big of a telescope do we need to be able to see the features that we want to see in order to find life before I die, you know. And part of this is figuring out what does this, how does the star impact these features, the atmosphere, the biosignatures, and the spectral features. So um, UV is interesting because, you know, it destroys some biosignatures, making it harder to see, like methane. Uh, and so then you would have a, maybe a harder time seeing methane around a UV active planet. Uh, or a star, but it also produces other biosignatures like ozone. Uh, oxygen, uh, ozone is a photochemical product of oxygen and it's much easier to see in, in spectra than oxygen, so that makes uh, it easier. And fundamentally, it's really this ratio of far UV to near UV that matters, and so we'll be talking um, a bit about that. And that's just because these different production and destruction reaction rates, some of them will go based on the different uh, cross-sections, so you know, you have the production of ozone needs far UV photons, uh, but the destruction of ozone can proceed with near UV photons. So this balance of far UV and near UV will ultimately uh, determine the abundance of ozone for the same concentration of oxygen in your atmosphere. When we also think about FGKM stars, um, you know, when we, if I'm gonna, you know, uh, make some broad statements here, you know, the, the F stars, they have really high near UV flux because their black body is still um, in the, uh, UV, whereas as we get to M stars, you have low near UV flux here and really high far UV emission. And so again, that's that balance of this far UV and near UV playing out, and which is why you have to have good observations, um, uh, which the muscles teams, for example, provide here uh, to get those uh, inputs into our, into our models. So I'm going to spend a little time on M stars because, you know, they are the most abundant stars uh, in our uh, galaxy and, and universe uh, with 75% of those stars. And we found from Kepler that roughly maybe 25% of M stars have a habitable planet, whether they are, have atmospheres or not. That's like, you know, eh, I hope they do, but they might not. Um, and so uh, there's reasons though why we're looking for them first. You know, the, the transit depth is, um, you know, just a, a lot more advantageous. In addition, the, they transit more frequently because their habitable zones are closer in, so we can add up the observational hours we need uh, much better. So there's a lot of advantages. But they flare a lot, and that might be why those atmospheres are not there, or, you know, might influence uh, the habitability of those systems. And hotter M stars can remain active for one to two billion years, which our sun was active for like half a billion years, you know. And uh, cooler uh, M stars remain active for six to eight billion years, you know, which is insane when we think about it. Uh, so, so this is why uh, we need to figure out the, um, uh, the, the, these activity levels, which is why I was a co on the muscles team and trying to get some of this thing. And we really want to try to constrain these UV environments. So if we compare these two extremes, like an Earth-like planet orbiting an M5 star, for example, like this is just the middle range, and this is now taking, this is not a realistic star, this is a theoretical minimum, just like photosphere only model, I want to be very clear about that, uh, but just to show you that like just taking the same star, same planet, all the same fluxes coming from the surface, and we're just doing whether it's um, a flaring star versus this uh, photosphere only star. Huge difference in the sort of spectra that you get because of the abundance of molecules that can survive and, and are stable in that planetary atmosphere. Um, so just to say that I think it's really important for us to, to understand that. Um, additionally, you know, here's some, uh, the list of known false positives for oxygen and ozone. There's a bunch of them. Most of them are most prevalent for M stars. You know, and all of them depend on the UV radiation. So here's an example of uh, one false positive mechanism. You have a pre-luminous pre-main sequence M dwarf scenario where that EUV would break apart water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is light and it escapes, and then the oxygen is left behind. And whether how much oxygen reacts with the surface, um, et cetera, will depend on sort of what uh, features we would we would see. So on Earth, this combination of biosignature gases, we have oxygen and now ozone produced then from life. We have methane uh, 300 times more abundant uh, with life than, say, from volcanism. 
but individually, these gases are not sufficient, right? Because we know that you could break apart uh, water or CO2 with high UV photons and, and get oxygen and ozone. And you can get methane from uh, volcanoes and serpentinization, right? So uh, as individual gases, these are not sufficient. So when an alien astronomer, if she were looking at Earth, she would see that it's the combination of these gases that is uh, making this strong biosignature to date. All right, so I hope I've convinced you UV matters. You're already here in Boulder, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure you are convinced because um, all your colleagues are doing great work in, in, uh, in that area. Um, so now I want to discuss just like oxygen biosignatures through geological time and how we might be able to see them. Because Earth has, you know, if we think of Earth as an exoplanet, it has really been many planets. It's, it's had its biogeochemical evolution, and it's not just this one planet, right? It's changed a lot in its four and a half billion year lifetime. So, I mean, uh, constraining the early atmosphere is really hard, you know, lots of uncertainties. But broadly speaking, you know, we had the rise of oxygen and kind of these two steps and CO2s like come down in time and same with methane. And so we can pick out um, some, some time points that might be interesting, like a prebiotic planet after the uh, first rise of oxygen, after the second rise of oxygen in modern Earth to see how detectable is our global biosphere on Earth to an alien astronomer around different stars. So if we um, build this up and we look at bio, uh, biosignature detection through time, here's FGKM stars, you know, with M being the, these little red lines and F being the black lines. And so here in this pre-life scenario, we're assuming, you know, higher abundance of CO2. We actually see this double feature of CO2 that comes out when you have about 10% of the atmosphere with CO2. Then um, here's after the first rise of oxygen, you can start to see already for those hotter F stars, we already have a pretty strong ozone feature popping out, right? Um, and then uh, with the 10% uh, modern concentrations of oxygen, we start getting that ozone feature for a higher number of stars. And then we have the modern atmosphere where you can see ozone for most of those star types. Now, what's interesting is we want to really focus on like this combination of biosignatures, but just to point out, like that ozone really overlaps that CO2 band. So if there's a lot of CO2 in your exoplanet atmosphere, your Earth-like planet atmosphere, even if it has life, it's going to be really hard to find that ozone because it's um, in the wings of the band. You're going to really need high resolution, which none of these uh, space-based missions are, are capable of doing. Uh, not to be depressing, but um, that, is the, that is the reality. Um, then we also have this combination of gases of methane and ozone together would be great, you know, and for um, depending on the, the star type and the exact atmosphere uh, that you determine, you can detect it for around 2 billion years of Earth history, um, uh, but not in the early Earth history. It would be really hard to, to see. So we can put these through the life uh, simulator and see, like, can we see ourselves with this mission that I really hope we, we can uh, fly. And uh, so we, we took these, the, my models and put them through this uh, life simulator to see where can we do it. So basically here, this is the modern Earth. That's that, um, uh, sorry, prebiotic Earth, first rise of oxygen, second, and modern Earth. And you can see um, where can we constrain. We want to look for the nice... Uh, like bell curve distribution area where we can see, uh, put a constraint on the feature. If it's flat like this, there's, there's no constraint of the abundance. Um, so we can say that we're not able to detect N2O or CO at all with um, a life mission, and we're able to see ozone for uh, once we have 10% of modern concentrations and above. Um, we're able to see methane for uh, uh, these middle cases, but it's harder to see, you know, as we get to modern Earth concentrations, the methane's harder to constrain, um, CO2 uh, and water here as well. So one thing that um, I'm also interested in leading this project right now is, could we detect oceans on another planet? How well can we constrain the water abundance? Because we want to constrain uh, atmosphere, uh, like habitability. So this, this question that we're looking at now is, can life distinguish between a water-rich and a water-poor atmosphere? And so um, with uh, Eleonora, uh, she's now a postdoc at Goddard, and we've been uh, working on this together and looking at the 
water abundance and where it can be detectable. And the summary is for high water cases, it's hard to constrain. For these middle water cases, it's easier to constrain. And then when you go to low water abundances, it's really hard to constrain again. And so like, it's like Earth-like kind of water concentrations that are easiest to constrain. And a lot lower and a lot higher, like a steam atmosphere or something, is really difficult. And why that is, is hmm? yeah? What is Yeah, so I mean, it depends on stratosphere or like surface, right? Um, but it, uh, what is it in like the stratosphere? Earthiest, it's more like here, you know, um, for, for our abundances for where we would be detecting it. Um, but yeah, so what happens is, is like in these high water cases, it just flat, the, the spectra is just flat. You know, water is absorbing everywhere and it's just a flat spectra. Um, you know, and then when there's no water, it's like really hard to see too. Okay, so so that's kind of depressing. Um, but what what we might want to think about is um, I was talking to Jim Casting, and he was like, "That's probably fine," you know, because uh, I was a little depressed, you know, by the, by this this result. And he said, "Well, okay, but um, water vapor that's stable in the atmosphere means that um, it likely indicates surface oceans, because if there's too, if there's only a little water vapor in the atmosphere, it would react with the rocks." Right, like it wouldn't be stable in the atmosphere. Um, and if we have like the steamy atmosphere, it's like on its way to Venus, you know. Um, so in terms of detecting habitability, actually just detecting water vapor in the atmosphere is probably a good proxy for there uh, being a surface reservoir of water. Um, so, so that uh, hopefully is, is okay. Um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Bethan's work here. She's um, a uh, postdoc and my first graduate student that I worked with. And we wanted to constrain um, oxygen concentrations through Earth's history. So uh, Beth and I worked with um, at St. Andrews, and she's now at LASP here. Um, and uh, what her thesis did is we looked at, could we use 1D modeling to help find uh, stable O2 concentrations in, in Earth's history, right? Um, and so what she noticed is that like if we have um, a lot of models previously had just like fixed the mixing ratios. They're like, this is the oxygen concentration, tell me how to make that planet. Um, and then you can get stable solutions, sure. Um, but that's not how life works, right? It's gonna change the fluxes at the surface. So like life is gonna produce more oxygen increasingly and, and what is then gonna be stable in the atmosphere. And so if you do a flux driven model, those uh, cases drop away in the middle. And so you have this region of instability in your modeling where um, the oxygen is, is uh, those, those levels of oxygen are not um, found. And so uh, she did a lot of work, you know, to show that basically uh, oxygen was um, below uh, this level uh, and then suddenly shifted to around 1% uh, uh, PAL uh, in the atmosphere from like this flux driven model and that's, and that's part of her thesis. And we can then say, okay, can we, when can we detect this? So going back to um, bringing that, linking that to spectra, if we look at how this is also influenced by clouds, uh, with these oxygen levels of 110 and 100%, so that's 1%, 10 and 100, and different cloud coverages, 100% uh, clouds here, you can see these features are actually uh, uh, deeper, right? Because uh, the clouds are more reflective, you get a bigger signal, and oxygen is pretty well mixed in the atmosphere. So clouds can actually help you um, detect uh, oxygen, even though they dampen a little bit the feature below. If we just look at, you know, the normalized reflectivity, it's a little less. But what we see uh, with a telescope has that get, gets it, is balanced out by that increase in reflectivity. And so, working with a, another grad student that I advised, um, we looked at how this would work with the HWO uh, at that point, uh, Lou Bois, and seeing for different oxygen concentrations, how many hours would you need um, uh, with different cloud coverage? So this is the altitude of cloud layers, the percent cloud coverage. You know, for uh, your 1%, really hard to do, you know, and, and uh, start 0.1%, you know, maybe uh, really getting quite easy for the, the half PAL and, and modern concentrations. Um, what was, again, kind of worthwhile to note is methane is gonna be, uh, at Earth concentrations, would be impossible with habitable worlds. So if we look at, um, you know, this is like kind of earlier 
earth uh, methane concentrations, we can detect methane quite well. But as soon as we get to like modern concentrations of earth, it's like tens of thousands of hours, you know, with, with how it'll world. So it's just like uh, not, not possible. Um, yeah, so for the last part of my talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about like alien abiotic skies and, and science, some like taking it away from uh, more modern earth sort of things or early earth sort of things. Um, and when we start thinking about this, I love this quote by George Whitesides, you know, it's very poetic. It's a long way from slime to Mozart, you know. Um, but then uh, Steve Benner said, well, it's a long way from HCN to slime, you know, going from prebiotic molecule to the first cell, super hard, you know, and so uh, that's also something that I'm really interested in is this prebiotic chemistry, can we detect prebiotic chemistry, what are these prebiotic signatures, um, so you can have, like we did this paper uh, with Paul Rimmer and Sukrit Ranjan, and looking at the detectability and prebiotic formation signatures of uh, how these various prebiotic molecules are formed and then where their features are in the spectra. And uh, one thing to note here is your C to O ratio of your planetary system strongly determines like what kind of uh, molecules will be present uh, and how, uh, you know, basically how much oxygen and where the oxygen goes. So if you have a C to O ratio less than one, you know, you're going to have, you know, bulk atmosphere kind of like Earth and, and these are going to be your lightning outputs and your, um, you know, impact. Uh, formations and your volcanism, and as you go to a more carbon-rich scenario, you start having a lot more hydrocarbons and, and uh, uh, species like that. So um, HCN is this molecule that people in prebiotic chemists really love to talk about because it seems to be central for a lot of these prebiotic mechanisms. So we wanted to see can, you know, what's the HCN ratio and, and how detectable it is. Um, and basically the HCN ratio will determine, will be to dependent uh, strongly on the C to O ratio and um, the, uh, and how much uh, methane there is uh, will depend on then where you're, how, how much HCN you form, as well as how much flares you have. So flares will produce a lot of HCN, um, and if you have shielded of your flares, you're going to have less HCN. Basically, that's what this plot shows. And um, so uh, what we wanted to do is then look at, you can see in this mixing ratio plot here, we have for atmospheres with more uh, hydrogen and methane, you have much more uh, HCN compared to atmospheres with less methane and hydrogen, you know, by like many orders of, of magnitude in the, in the mixing ratios. Um, and I, I know I only have like huh, seven minutes left, so hopefully I'll, I'll uh, get through this. But basically, we would, I wanted to see what can we detect with these sorts of, um, uh, can we detect HCN? So we took an early Earth and an 80 LEO uh, case. Um, here what I want to walk you through is these blue lines are just your main constituents of the atmosphere. So the dashed line is the total spectra. The water, methane, CO2 are these blue lines. Um, the, uh, we looked at N2O, HCN, and ethane. Um, and for these different atmospheric cases. So you start to see a little peak of HCN, not much, uh, when you increase the hydrogen. Then when we increase uh, uh, methane, just methane, and have low hydrogen, oh wow, we see a lot of, of HCN. Um, and then when you have high amounts of both, you see a large quantity of like ethane and, and uh, HCN. But sadly, it doesn't really change that dashed line. Like even though there's uh, a lot of HCN in the atmosphere, it's just being, um, it's overlapping with like water and CO2 and methane, right, in the, in the atmosphere. So it's actually very difficult to detect in low resolution um, in, the, in the IR. Um, so what could we do? Maybe high resolution from the ground. And so this is looking at some of this work by Ignace Snellen, right, where you can uh, have the Doppler shift of the planet going around, and uh, those those lines with high resolution will drift across our own spectra. So we're uh, we're looking through Earth's atmosphere and all of our uh, atmospheric constituents, um, and so those are like these dark lines. Say that's Earth's CO2 and our CO in this case, and that that drifting sinusoidal curve is from the Doppler shift of the planet going around. Um, 
with a star. So this is a super cool technique, um, this high resolution spectroscopy, and we can uh, detect uh, various molecules. So by using cross-correlation, you can march your high resolution template with your observations and you know, get a match for, for different molecules uh, in, in the atmosphere. So I think this is really cool. This has already um, been used uh, in, in some ways to find um, HCN and uh, uh, ammonia. So we have, like, that's that transit, you know, that dashed line uh, that was from that, uh, that first plot I showed of the, of the uh, Doppler shift. So that's the uh, detection of HCN. And um, what blew my mind the most, I think, when I was first l learning about this is we could maybe detect isotopes in exoplanets. If you haven't heard about this, I think it's super exciting. Uh, Paul Moliere at MPIA um, did some of this work, and we could actually see the difference between C13O and C12O because the high resolution spectra is very different. Um, and so for like hot Jupiters, this is actually detectable now. You know, with PriRes Plus, there was a lot of delays with COVID. I think they're going to now start um, looking at it. It's back online. Um, and then, you know, maybe detecting HDO, you know, with uh, uh, the ELT with Proxima Centauri. It's possible in one, one night of observations with ELT. Um, so I think that's, like, really exciting uh, kind of stuff that we can, we can look forward to. For doing Earths and Super Earths, though, really we do need um, ELT. And in terms of the big uh, ground-based observatories, GMT is just not big enough. Um, ELT is, is really where we need to go for getting some of these uh, high-resolution fe fe uh, features for Earth-like planets. So maybe we could do that with HCN, you know, uh, long story short. You know, because the, the atmosphere with HCN and without HCN in the near infrared, because, of course, we have the thermal background uh, of the ground to contend with, so we can't do anything longer than five microns unless we're like on the moon or something. Um, so, so then we can maybe start to tease out some of these more minor species with high resolution spectroscopy and that hopefully can help us tease out like these prebiotic scenarios, these planets with different sorts of atmospheres and, and try to characterize those. So yeah, so we're, we have this technological hurdle as I've talked about with this first opportunity coming online now with James Webb, Ariel soon uh, in this de uh, decade, as well as ELT. Um, and then, you know, eventually uh, HWO, hopefully life, um, to be able to do an uh, even better job of characterizing a statistically relevant sample size of Earth-like planets. We're still going to be left with this interpretation hurdle. You know, of like, what are we seeing? We're going to argue about it, I'm sure. Um, you know, and, and our own three terrestrial planets are very different, and of course we're going to see you know, so many different types of terrestrial uh, atmospheres uh, with, with those future missions. So the way I like to think about it is, you know, Earth has taken this one little path, you know, on its way through, through, uh, through its evolution, and we have these sorts of biosignature gases, but, like, planets could have done other things, and, you know, maybe, I don't know if you agree if phosphine's a biosignature, but maybe it is, and here it is, you know. Um, what about uh, ammonia in an H2-rich atmosphere, possibly? Some other weird stuff, you know, that we don't know yet. Um, who knows? Uh, we might be able to see HCN that might represent a failed biosphere or a stalled biosphere, something that's like was on its way but then did not have the complexity to fully get to a uh, full biosphere. And, um, you know, that's what I'm excited to, to learn about. Uh, so, you know, we have, you know, all these things. And so I'll leave it with a philosophical question. So even if we're not alone, I want to ask you, will we be satisfied? Because what I've been talking about is microbes. All I've been talking about is detecting microbes. You know, I, when I talk to the public, I don't think they're going to be excited about detecting microbes. I'm super excited. And I think you guys are excited. You know, but um, will that be enough? You know, even a ladybug is super complex, right? Like, I mean, billions of years of evolution went into this ladybug. But try to explain to this ladybug your iPhone or something. You know, it's like impossible. There's no communication necessary or uh, like possible. Um, so would that be enough? And so do we really need like this SETI signal um, to feel like we're not alone? Like basically even if we're not alone, will we still be lonely uh, in the universe? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, before we take questions, I want to just take a few minutes um, 
talk to you, your neighbors near you if you don't know them yet. Introduce yourself. Um, uh, chat about Sarah's talk. Is there like is there a question that you have? But you're like maybe that's I don't know if that's an obvious question. This would be a good time to just just, just chat about it a little bit, and then we'll come back and ask questions together. All right, finish up your thoughts, and then we'll come back for questions. All right, who, um, who has some questions for Sarah from that lovely talk? Yeah. Hi, Michaela Huffman. I work with Dave right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> the best moment. Um, and uh, my question is, if in the next 20 years, those 16,000 other biosignatures that life, lowercase, makes um, get better spectra, then how would life capital the mission? Uh, how would it change in response? Like, would it pivot or... Um, that's a really good question. So I think uh, there's still a problem of like abundance. So we definitely need the spectra, you know, to figure out what we're seeing and, and if those molecules are present in high quantities. And if we don't know what the spectra is, we're not going to be able to characterize the planet. But um, I expect those to especially help the high resolution ground based telescopes because I expect those to be present in more minor quantities. And so getting that high resolution spectra will hopefully be able to tease it out. Um, you know, I, I don't expect like uh, a super niche molecule to be, I don't know, like 20% of the atmosphere of an exoplanet just from kind of chemistry, you know, considerations. Um, so yeah, I don't think it would change life mission parameters super much, but I think we need it to, to understand these future observations. So uh, getting those lineless are really important. 
Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Fantastic talk. Uh, so there's there are a few interesting versions out there of this. So, but the one that comes to mind is Jim Green did a scale, like maybe five or ten years, mm -hmm. probably five years ago, of in terms of like what's the definitive yep. detection of life, right? So there's everything that comes from like the Carl Sagan contact, like yep. we got a signal, that's yep. a ten, yep. and then a zero would be like there is an, an atmosphere. Yeah. And so obviously there's a lot of gray area. Can you give us an idea using a scale, maybe something similar where like a 10 is definitive and zero is like moderately hopeful or not wildly <laughs> depressed. Um, can you give us a sense of what things excite you? What's in the seven, eight scale for you right now? Yeah. Um, mm, so interesting because it changes. So like my, my for example, um, Venus, right? Uh, before this whole Venus saga, whether or not phosphines in, in Venus's atmosphere, just um, when, when, the, when Clara first proposed phosphine as a biosignature, I was like, oh great, that sounds cool. You know, and then when it was proposed to be in Venus, I was like, that's not a biosignature in <laughs> Venus. <laughs> you know, we just don't understand atmosphere as well enough. We don't understand Venus. So I think like one thing that like that whole experience has like humbled me to to think like we just don't necessarily know all the way these molecules can be made. Um, let's think about dimethyl sulfide, right? Um, is that a biosignature? Maybe, uh, but that's like a very theoretical in this Hycean world sort of uh, way that's been uh, proposed. Uh, but if you have sulfide and you have a hydrogen-rich planet. Or if you have sulfur, you know, if you have a sulfur source and you have a lot of hydrogen around, maybe there's ways to produce that dimethyl sulfide that are not life, that we just haven't really thought about. Um, so I think, uh, long story short, I'm more depressed <laughs> <laughs> than I was, but I still, um, and, and, I, and I really, like, it kind of frustrates me that I keep coming back to oxygen and methane together, but that does seem to be a, a stronger signature. Like, those are just harder to coexist. Um, so I think, uh, despite that being proposed in, like, 1965, um, it's still the best biosignature combination we have. So if I saw oxygen and methane together, along with, like, you know, water and CO2 and stuff, I'd be like, yay, we probably found life, you know. And... Um, if I found a single ap like gas in any other type of atmosphere, I would not be super excited, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, you showed uh, one example case about uh, uh, two MDOF uh, yeah. atmosphere spectra in M5. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we have, for example, Trappist one yeah. in much cooler. Yeah stars, uh, yes. planets much yes. around much cooler than yeah. what's how you same sort of thing same yeah. in yeah. in m5 and uh, m5 and later you get that real mm -hmm. big change or any different so if yeah. you then the opposite <laughs> if mm -hmm. if hotter hotter um it becomes less and less of a difference mm -hmm. but yeah so the the m5 is like that transition point mm -hmm. um but uh yeah you you just build up these other species because the uv is so low mm -hmm. yeah uh, the near UV, especially. Mm -hmm. Hi, great talk. Um, so I'm I'm not like an expert on this at all, but I have a question about kind of the philosophical question that you had at the end yeah. there, um, and I'm wondering if there's you know life outside of Earth that you know exists in a form that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Do we have kind of a sense of how many maybe paths exist that we end up with life, uh, like kind of from a theoretical astrobiology standpoint? Yeah, I mean, long story short, there's a lot of great work in this area. Like, let's try to think of alternative uh, synthetic biology. Pathway Steve Benner looks at this sort of stuff. Um, uh, looking for shadow biospheres, not like a real... Um, you know, mainstream uh, research area, but I think super interesting. Like, if there was a non sort of uh, DNA uh, based life on Earth, would we even know? 
you know, because all of our life detection is so rooted in looking for Earth. So there could even be a whole shadow biosphere in the sub subsurface or what whatnot on Earth, and we couldn't know about it. So there's some interesting work there. Um, long story short, we have no idea because we have one example <laughs> of life, you know, and we so we have no ability to extend that to um, any sort of meaningful conversation about uh, life on I in weird systems on other planets. But I think uh, looking in the solar system in these weird environments, doing synthetic biology, um, and trying to figure that out, like if Titan has life, what a wild and weird world that is, and like figuring out what those metabolisms are and those biosignatures and all that stuff will be super exciting. But until we have like more than one example of life, I'm not really sure we're able to answer. So we don't know yet if life's biochemistry is highly constrained or if it's very flexible. Hi, nice talk. Thank you. Um, Will Walks. Uh, I do exoplanets and atmospheres and things like that. Um, so in this department especially, we're often talking about um, trying to connect planetary science and exoplanet work. Uh, I have a sort of parallel question or a thought what to what extent are we limiting ourselves by not um, bringing chemists in on this problem? Yeah, um, I think uh, the the chemists are in on this problem. So there's a lot of interesting work with um, Jack Shostak, John Sutherland, Paul Rimmer. Um, like a lot of people are trying to make this gap, especially Paul because he is an astronomer but also does laboratory prebiotic chemistry. I mean, whoa. Um, so there are uh, people in origins, specifically origins of life research, those chemists. Um, there's, there's a bunch of them and they're all interested in making these gaps. So the Simon Foundation was a big part of bringing that collaboration together, but um, those networks still exist. So I think, uh, I think you know, it would be great for where the, you know, it would be great to have more of it, but we are doing that. Hi, that was an awesome talk. Um, I'm Mike Rothman. Um, I was curious, are there any hurdles you see to this kind of research that you view as um, impossible to kind of get through or get over? Yeah. Um, uh, great depressing question. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's going to be really hard to do the interpretation hurdle. So I don't know if we'll ever know, you know, without like that kind of uh, SETI signal. Um, I don't know if we're going to um, ever be able to fully tease away like those false positives, which I think is really important. You know, I think we need to be humble about it. Um, I'm doing some work right now to see if we can have a double false positive, you know, of oxygen and methane. That would be horrible if it's true, you know, but it, we need to know, right? So, um, so I think that's the thing that uh, worries me the most, shall we say? Um, then, of course, there's just, uh, you know, uh, life has not been selected yet, uh, so that might not might not happen. And of course, the European Space Agency just has less money than NASA, so that's like another hurdle that I'm very concerned about on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's kind of similar to worries, I guess, or concerns you might have about, you know, the, the likelihood that there will be many, many non-detections before there's anything resembling a detection. And how do you deal with that <clears throat> from a, you know, societal perspective of trying to obtain, you know, funding and support for these kinds of large-scale projects? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, like, two components to that question. One is, like, what the public, like, general public thinks. You know, and then one is, you know, what our community thinks about these things. So, um, so our community, I think we can do that case, you know, of like looking at, well, how c well can we know this? We're going to be arguing about it. And we do that all the time with the Martian meteorite, you know, back and forth and back and forth in so many papers, you know. Um, and uh, there's lots of debate in the field. I think that's really healthy, and that's how we uh, get a more robust understanding. And hopefully that debate will motivate new questions, new funding, and, and figure out what we need to know in order to hone in on, on those error bars. Um, in the public, I think that in some ways worries me more because I think like most people that I talk to already think we found aliens and we're hiding them, you know? Uh, like, 
you know, quite frankly. Um, you know, my sister, when I was a grad student, like, this was the Mayan apocalypse 2012, right, you know, um, she, like, called me up, and she's like, you would tell me, right? <laughs> uh, so, I, I, you know, I feel like there's just, um, you know, most people think we've already found life. So I think the general public is going to be really underwhelmed when we actually make this mo monumental discovery, which is, like, I think the most important discovery of humans um, if we're not alone in the universe. And I think they're going to be like, oh, but they're already here. You know, like, Obama's an alien or something. You know, like, there's going to be this, um, this kind of underwhelming response, I think. Uh, so I would like to do more public science communication on that. Uh, but I think our community uh, will be appropriately excited. We'll, we'll pop open the champagne and have a lot of time. Yeah. All right. Um, we're at the hour, so let's uh, please thank Sarah one more time.